Hey, I'm Dave. Welcome to my shop. I'm Dave Plummer, a retired operating systems engineer from Microsoft, going back to the MS-DOS and Windows 95 days. And today, we're going to begin our adventures in 10 gigabit networking by answering some of the most basic, fundamental questions you have. Like, what are the various ways that you can connect two computers to each other at 10 gigabit speeds? And what about three computers? Or more? Well, from copper to fiber optics to good old twisted pair RJ45, if you've got any curiosity about 10 gigabit networking, this is the episode that you need to see. This topic is one that has remained popular on my channel since the very beginning, so I figured it was time to revisit and update the topic. First, we'll look at direct attached copper cables. These are these fancy pants units right here that look like they should be really expensive, but in fact aren't. I'm very fond of them because they seem super robust and reliable. Next, we have fiber optics, which are surprisingly easy to work with. And of course, where would we be without good old twisted pair RJ45? I'll let you know what kind of cables you need and what the odds are that your existing cabling will work. And for those of you with a taste for the Mac life, there's Thunderbolt, and it turns out there are two very good reasons for even PC users to care. Once we've covered the interconnect cabling, we'll talk about the ports and the transceivers, so let's get right to it and review the primary means of connecting computers at 10 gigabits. So this is the point at which most people take you on a tour of their home network, kind of expect you to reverse engineer what they did and how they got there, be impressed by it, and then apply it to your own situation. I'm not going to do you like that. We're going to start with a blank slate. Let's say the PCs are represented by these two network cards. Because they're SFP+, all we need now is a direct attached copper cable, like so. We simply plug one into one PC, plug the other end into the other PC, and instant 10 gigabit connection. Good to go. Now to release one of these SFP connections, here's a little tab here, and we need to pull on that. Helps if you push in on the cable at the same time, and they slide on out easily. Now this is all well and good if your PCs are within the same room or somewhere that you can easily run this DAC cable. However, if you're gonna run longer runs, you probably wanna consider fiber. Now to connect the fiber cable to the port, you of course need the fiber optic transceiver. This little giga here is for releasing and pulling out the SFP adapter, but it also retains and holds in the plastic cable housing. So, once we insert it like this, and let the other side like so, we can simply insert it as if it were a pre-made cable. There you go, your first super exotic fiber optic connection, up and running. Well, if we're powered and plugged into something. Now to remove these, you've got to push down on the plastic tab. Let me uh, do the other one and I'll turn it sideways so you can see better. That releases it, and then to slide out the transceiver, pull down the giga and yank out the transceiver. And surprising fact, the retention clip really is called a giga. You can look that up on Wikipedia. Impress your friends. Tell someone now. Now, unlike the DAC cables, Twisted Pair is not wired with a crossover, so we're going to use this little module which flips, receive, and transmit, and that will give us the ability to connect one directly to the other without a switch. So we simply insert the two transceivers, plug the RJ45 cables into the transceivers, and then each one into the coupler. And this special coupler is what contains the crossover circuit that flips to receive and transmit. And there you go, two PCs connected at 10 gigabits by a twisted pair. But this contraption with the crossover module is more complicated than it needs to be because you can buy Ethernet cables that have the crossover built in. This fancy yellow one is such a crossover. So, the simplest one yet, two cards, one cable, and a lot less messy. To remove the transceivers, we first need to remove the cable, and then we flip down the little retention bar. We can then pull the transceiver out of the card. Now, if these had been RJ45 cards in the first place, we wouldn't have needed the transceivers, and it would just be the cable in that case. Now, what if you wanted to connect three PCs? You're probably thinking, eh, it's time for a switch. But not necessarily. With simply two cables, as long as one of them is in fact a dual port card, you can, through software routing, simply wire them like this. Watch me bend this cable in the wrong direction in order to show you how not to do things. This is purely instructive, not a mistake on my part. Now if your situation gets any more complicated, you pretty much have to resort to using a switch. So let's remove this center guy and replace him with a MicroTik switch. Now, in all these direct connect scenarios, we've assumed that you're getting your internet through some other means, like the other original onboard single gigabit NIC. But if that's not the case, and you want to supply it through the single 10 gigabit connection, 
Then the switch allows you to have an uplink port, which you can tie back into your existing LAN WAN setup. And this port is only a single gigabit, so it doesn't matter what you plug it into, it's one gig. Now let's assume the more realistic case where one of these PCs is further away and needs to be connected through some other means like fiber. So let's get rid of the direct attached copper on this one side and we'll replace it with a fiber link. Now while an RJ45 cable with a transceiver would be limited to 30 meters and a native port would be 100 meters, fiber of the OM3 variety will run up to 300 meters. These transceivers are actually rated for 300 meters as well, so it's not purely theoretical. In fact, all you need to do is use a longer cable. So, why don't we try that? We'll remove this uh, short cable. And slam down this big spool of 75 meters. Now remember, you can go four times this. This gives you a pretty good representation of a scenario where you've got a server room with one computer connected by direct attached copper, the switch, and then a remote computer connected by fiber. And here's the module you need to pass it through one of those little Leviton wall plates and make a fiber connection in the room tidy. Now I'll reconnect it as though it were going into a wall plate in a room. We'll use this as the in-room cable and the long one as the in-wall cable. They connect via the module that goes into the wall plate. Now there's a 50-50 shot that I've got this module backwards because I didn't actually look. I'm a busy man. And like Bill O'Reilly on Inside Edition, we're doing it live. Do it live! I can, I'll write it and we'll do it live! There we have our little model of a server room and a remote PC connected by a fiber through a wall plate. Getting its internet through an RJ45 connection back to the home LAN. And I've just complicated it a little further by adding a 10 gigabit RJ45 connection. Now some would be content, some would stop there, but not me. Especially when I'm working off camera, I'm extremely bold, so let's add yet another client here. We'll put back in this dual NIC, and we'll use one of his ports to connect back to the switch. As another cautionary example for your educational benefit, I'm going to wire it in a way that triggers people. What do you think of that? Does that bother you? Bothers me. Let me fix that. What I find fascinating is that some percentage of the population will be like, huh, what? Where did it even change? And others will be like, oh, thank goodness. Now that I see this, it's going to make one dandy thumbnail. This configuration would actually work pretty well for a small video studio where you have two editors that need 10 gig access to, say, a network attached storage that is also at 10 gig. And because the switch is SFP, we've done most everything else in SFP for economical reasons. Well, with the cabling basics well covered, it's time to take a look at the ports and transceivers. In the previous segment, we saw two types of ports. The standard RJ45 port, which you are presumably pretty familiar with, and then the big empty rectangle port known as SFP. But for 10 gigabit though, it actually has to be an SFP Plus port. The electronics in the SFP Plus port do not connect directly to the cable. Rather, they provide an interface inside that the transceiver module connects to on one end. On the other end, it connects to whatever physical layer you're using. Direct attached copper cables typically have the transceiver unit built into the cable end, so it's all one piece. So perhaps it's best to think of the transceiver as kind of an adapter that goes from the SFP port to whatever cable type you're using. Now for fiber optics, the transceiver takes data and power from the SFP Plus port and then uses it to drive either lasers or LEDs inside the transceiver. The light from that laser or those LEDs is then sent down and out the fiber optic cable to the destination transceiver on the other end. Lasers are generally more powerful and selective and are used primarily for what is known as single mode fiber where the data is sent down the glass in a single coherent laser beam. LED transceivers, in contrast, are normally used for multi-mode fiber and they send their data by illuminating the entire glass strand without worrying about what angle of incidence they're at and so on. Now with the laser, you can actually multiplex multiple signals at different angles going into the cable, but with multi-mode fiber, only the one stream can be sent. In addition to fiber optics and copper, we also have RJ45. In the case of Twisted Pair, the transceiver connects to the SFP Plus port on one end and then exposes an RJ45 port on the other so that you can plug a regular RJ45 cable into it. Of course, that cable will have to be CAT5E, CAT6, or CAT6A depending on the length, but otherwise, it's just like having an RJ45 port on a regular switch. Well, almost. There's one caveat, and I learned it the hard way. For reasons I don't fully understand, but that I suspect are limited to limitations on how much power a transceiver is able to draw from the port, 
the RJ45 port that you'll find in a transceiver module is simply not as powerful as a native 10 gigabit port on an RJ45 switch. A transceiver module can only push the signal about 30 meters reliably, whereas a native RJ45 port can go up to 100 meters. Since my shop is about 50 meters from my rack, I found out the hard way that I had to buy a switch with actual RJ45 ports. For comparison, here's a Microtech switch. It's a fine little switch if a bit warm in operation, and it's very cost effective at about 138 now, which is three times what it used to cost, but so is everything else. I'll put a link to them in the video description, and I highly recommend them for the price with only one reservation. And that reservation isn't a fault of the switch, but a limitation of using the RJ45 ports over SFP transceivers. You see, this switch has no 10 gigabit RJ45 ports. They're all SFP. The single twisted pair port is the upstream gigabit port. To run RJ45 cables into it, you need to use a transceiver, which as I said is limited to about 30 meters or 100 feet. If you're in a regular home or a small office, you'll likely be fine, but if there's any distance involved, be sure to keep it in mind. If, like me, you absolutely need 10 gigabit RJ45 ports because of the distance, then it depends on how many you need. With just two ports, I was able to receive the upstream 10 gigabit port and connect it to a downstream 10 gigabit switch, which addressed all my needs out here in the shop. Had I opted to pull a new cable between the house and the shop, I would have simply pulled a big run of fiber optics and been done with it, but this setup allowed me to use the existing cable under the driveway and the existing cable infrastructure, and it's all CAT6. Now, a quick note on cable types for twisted pair, because there are three types that you will be concerned with. The first is CAT5E, likely the most common style out there. Now, it isn't rated officially, but it will usually work at 10 gigabit for short runs. CAT6 has better shielding and is rated for up to about 30 meters, though I've had good luck with it working all the way out to about 75. For proper reliability, though, you want CAT6A. The only hard choice you're going to have to make is really between CAT6 and 6A. CAT6 is cheaper, but perhaps more importantly, it's much easier to work with if you're planning on doing your own cable termination, because CAT6A has extra shielding and insulation, and it's just more complicated to deal with. So if the 100 meter range of CAT6A isn't a requirement, and if you're doing your own cabling, I recommend you check out plain old CAT6. And if someone else is doing the work, get it bid both ways, and if the price is close, go with 6A instead. When you need only two 10 gigabit ports, as I did, I recommend the Netgear ProSafe switch. At $99 back when I bought it, it's a switch with two 10 gigabit RJ45 ports and several standard gigabit ports. As noted, I used it as an uplink switch to my Microtech, which has the extra SFP Plus ports. Out here in the shop, I have three devices running at 10 gigabits. My Mac Studio with an external 10 gigabit Thunderbolt adapter, my 3970 XPC with a 10 gigabit card, and the Synology 12 bay NAS. Believe it or not, I was experiencing data corruption at high load on the Synology using a 10 gigabit card, so I threw in a cheap aftermarket card instead. I got lucky and the version of Linux on the NAS appeared to already have drivers for it, and it all just worked. One of the easiest ways to connect any two modern computers is via Thunderbolt. Here I have my Threadripper connected by Thunderbolt 3 to a MacBook Pro, which in turn is daisy-chained to a second MacBook Pro. Not only do they connect from one to the other, but the PC can see the Thunderbolt IP of the machine on the far end, so there's clearly some automatic routing going on as well. The only problem with this setup is that unless you properly configure DHCP or Bonjour, then you can only work by IP address across the Mac PC boundary. But within ecosystems, though, it all works pretty much as expected. As you may know, Thunderbolt is marketed as a 40 gigabit connection, but as with most things in life, it's not quite so simple. Now first off, that's total bandwidth in both directions, so in terms of full duplex connections, it builds itself as 20 gigabits in both directions under my device manager. My testing was not as promising, however, as I got a best of about 800 megabytes a second, or 8 gigabits, using the uh, Blackmagic disk transfer test. Between the PC and the Mac, it was even slower, closer to like gigabit performance. The odd thing is that the interface is clearly capable of a reliable 10 gig in both directions because my Thunderbolt 3 network adapter, which can do it, connects to that same port. In the server rack, I'm running two devices that natively support 10 gigabits. First, I have the Unity Dream Machine Pro, which has both a 10 gigabit internet WAN port and a 10 gigabit LAN side port as well. Even though I don't yet have 10 gigabit internet, the UDM Pro connects that 10 gig to the main distribution switch, also from Ubiquiti. 
I have a mix of native 10 gigabit RJ45 ports that I use for the longer runs like out to the shop and office, and then SFP Plus ports that I use for devices near the server closet. Whenever possible, I like the direct simplicity of attached copper. So, for example, my NAS actually has an SFP Plus PCI card, and so it connects directly to the switch at 10 gigabits over a simple copper cable. Failing copper, I actually prefer fiber and then RJ45. If you're interested in how to optimize your 10 gigabit network with things like jumbo frames and static routes and so on, make sure you subscribe to my channel and turn on the bell icon as well so that you're notified when follow-up episodes appear. If you have any interest in matters related to ASD, autism, or Asperger's, or just want more stories from my Microsoft days, please check out my book in the video description, Secrets of the Autistic Millionaire. It's available on Amazon now where you can also read the sample chapter, Burgers with Bill Gates. And the ebook is on sale for under 10 bucks, so check it out. Thanks for stopping by the shop today, and in the meantime and in between time, I hope to see you next time, right here in Dave's Garage. Do it, Lynn! Do it, do it, do it!